The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You are going to hear a conversation about renting an apartment. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. How can I help you, sir? Hi, I'm interested in renting an apartment in your building. Can you show me around inside? Sure, my pleasure. Do you know what kind of apartment you're looking for? I'm thinking of something for my best friend and I. The apartment doesn't have to be too big, just something comfortable for the two of us. I'm looking for a kitchen, two bedrooms and a bathroom. Just something simple. OK, well, let me show you what we have to offer. We divide our apartments into three categories. There are standard apartments, upgraded standard apartments and luxury apartments. Please follow me. This apartment just went up for rent yesterday. The old tenants moved into a larger one. This apartment is what I call the standard apartment. It's small, but has everything you need. The kitchen comes with a refrigerator, an oven and a stove. There is one bathroom with a shower, but no bathtub. The rooms are a good size and both have their own closets. The living room has enough space for a couch. We will provide a television for you. These apartments are very popular with students because they are affordable and practical. Right now, we are renting these out for only $1,000 a month. I think this is a little bit on the small side. There's no space for a dining table or even for an extra desk. We will both need room to study. If there are guests over, we hope to be able to have a dining table big enough for at least four people. Do you have anything slightly larger? Maybe just an apartment with a bigger living room? Well, let's take a look. Right now, we also have an opening for a luxury apartment. This apartment is larger. It has three bedrooms, and all three are larger than the last one. And there are two bathrooms, and all have bathtubs. The kitchen is also larger, and come with an additional dishwasher and freezer. The living space has plenty of space for a dining room. How much is the rent on these apartments? These are more expensive, usually in the $2,500 range. Don't forget that there is an, an additional bedroom, so you could find another roommate to lower the cost. Hmm, I think that's a little bit on the expensive side. We don't really have the time to find another roommate, so it's probably better to stick with the two bedroom places. Is there anything between these two? Come with me. I can show you this apartment right now, but there are people living in it. There are no more of these kinds of apartments available at this moment, but if you decide that you like it, I can put you on the waiting list, and as soon as we have openings, you will be contacted. Sure, let's take a look. This is the upgraded standard apartment. As you can see, it's larger than the other two bedroom apartment. There are two bedrooms and two bathrooms, one in each room. The living room comes with a television, but no furniture. The kitchen is around the same size as the other smaller apartments. The basic difference is the additional bathroom and larger living room. These rent for around $1,400. Now look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. Seems like a good deal. Do you know when an apartment like this will be available? That's hard to say. I know these people who live here right now should be graduating soon, so they might be moving out. Well, I guess I'll put my name on the waiting list. Hopefully there'll be an opening as soon as possible. That sounds like a good plan. I will notify you as soon as we have vacancies. You will have to leave us some information and a student identification number. Sure, no problem. My full name is Robert Jack Browning. Could I have your age, please? I'm 38. Your major? I'm studying biology. How about naming some of your hobbies? Hmm, fishing, golf, watching movies and spending time with my family. Sounds like a good life. What is the price range of the apartment you are looking for? Somewhere between $1,000 to $1,500. Your student identification number, please? QS45890. Could you repeat that? QS45890. Lastly, could you leave us a phone number? OK. It's area code 236-580-2287. Thank you very much. I will give you a call as soon as possible. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two flatmates, Tom and Richard, talking about their new flatmate who has just moved in the week before. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Richard. I'm glad I caught you here. Can I just talk to you about something? Our new flatmate, Anders, is not quite what I had hoped. I was wondering if you shared my concerns about some of his behaviour. Uh, yes, Tom. I, I know what you mean, but we can't be entirely negative. He, he has good points. I mean, at least he's quiet. He doesn't play loud music all night or bother others or turn his TV up, disturbing everyone. Sure, he's quiet. But remember our last flatmate? He'd say hi to you and smile and treat everyone politely. In comparison, this new guy is very impolite. He just grunts in reply and sometimes ignores me altogether. I guess that's just his way. You know, just his character. I don't think he realises he's being impolite and it shouldn't matter to us too much. We can just ignore him too and quietly live our own lives. But his friends are hard to ignore when they visit. I know what you mean, but how often does that happen? I rarely see them, maybe once or twice a month. If they came more often, it might be a problem. But as it is, such rare visits don't matter so much. Wouldn't you say so? Well, I'm not sure, since it's very obvious when they're here because of all the cigarette smoke in the house. It stinks up the place, and you know we don't allow smoking on the premises. Well, I've never seen them doing this. Maybe they do it outside. Perhaps we can talk to Anders about it. Always remember, though, in one respect, he's a good tenant, and it's the most important aspect. The previous flatmate would always pay the rent late. I know what you're going to say. This guy pays promptly. But there's more to being a good tenant than prompt payment. I mean, you need to turn off the TV, clean up your dishes, 
dress respectably, be polite, and so on. I guess what I'm saying is that basically you need to cooperate with the others, and this new guy fails significantly in this respect. Okay, I suppose you have a point there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. I tell you what, Tom. Why don't we talk to our new flatmate Anders about these issues? If we throw him out, we'll have to go to all the trouble of finding another flatmate who might not necessarily be much better. So let's give the current guy a chance. Here, I've got a piece of paper. So let's make a short list of issues to discuss with him. Get it out into the open. Sure. We'll give him one more chance. So write communication. And let's tell him to. Well, we can't change a person's personality overnight. So why don't we have a weekly tenants' meeting, and we can just ask him to attend. That way, we can get to know him better. I'll write attend meeting, and we can take it from there. Okay, but we have to tell him about his friends. They can't just do whatever they want. Write a heading friends, and then write don't smoke anywhere, inside or outside. Well. Instead of being so direct and possibly causing offence, I'll just write "follow rules" and verbally mention the rules. TV off by 10 p.m. No loud music or bad behaviour, including smoking. Okay, do that. But I still think we need to specifically mention that last issue. You know how I can't stand the habit, so I'd like this to be another and separate point. Cigarettes strictly forbidden. And it's important to include the strictly here. We can't pussyfoot around too much. Sometimes directness is necessary. Okay, I'll write that. Forbidden. Okay. And what about cleaning duties? Anders is a little too relaxed about that. Dishes are sometimes not washed. Dirty teacups are left around the place, and so on. So write must do better. Yeah. Again, Tom, he might take that personally, and it could cause a scene. I'd rather be general. I'll write "must be done," and I'll tell him that that's for everyone, not just him. Okay? Okay. As long as he gets the message. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a radio program about do-it-yourself house painting. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives. Thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million liters of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools.
It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator along with the type of surface you're painting and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also, it's always better to buy high quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy. So washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, Long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint 
doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's program, I'll be giving some advice on... That is the end of Section 2. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at some of the features of modern houses. And today, we're going to turn the clock back and look at traditional house design. I've chosen to start with Samoa, which is part of a group of Polynesian islands in the South Pacific Sea, because the influence of culture and weather on house design is quite clear there. Um, so let's have a look at, first of all, at the overall design of a traditional Samoan house. Now, these days, houses in Samoa have become more modern and are usually rectangular. But traditional designs were round or sometimes they were oval in shape. Here's a picture. This traditional style is still used, often for guest houses or meeting houses, and most Samoan villages have at least one of these buildings. As you can see, there are no walls, so the air circulates freely around the house. Samoa is a place that experiences high temperatures, but the open design of the house also reflects the openness of Samoan society. If the occupants want shelter, there are several blinds made of coconut leaves that can be lowered during rainy or windy weather. Or indeed, the blinds can also be pulled down if people want some privacy. The foundations of the house, <clears throat> that's the part beneath the floor, are raised slightly. Um, in the past, the height was linked to the importance of the occupants, which we'll talk about another time. However, the floor of the house was usually covered with river stones, Today, we have a range of methods for balancing the temperature inside a building, but the stones on the floor of a Samoan home are ideal for cooling the building on hot days. Now, let's have a close look at the roof. This, as you can see in the picture, is dome-shaped and traditionally thatched or covered with leaves from the sugarcane, that's an established crop in Samoa. This was a job for the women and it involved twisting the leaves and then fastening them with a thin strip of coconut leaf before fixing them to the roof in several layers. Now, the shape of the roof is important. 
you can see that the sides are quite steep and that's done so that the rain falls straight to the ground without moisture going through the leaves and causing leaks or dampness inside the house. Then you'll notice how high the top of the roof is. This is a way of allowing heat to rise on sunny days and go through the thatching, thereby cooling the house. So, how does the house stay upright? Well, there are a number of evenly spaced posts inside. They um, they encircle the interior of the building and go up to the roof and support the beams there. They're also buried, uh, usually about a metre and a half in the ground to keep them firm. These posts are produced using local timber from the surrounding forests. They're cut by men from the family or village, and the number varies depending on the size and importance of the house. Now, these posts were a very significant part of Samoan culture and did much more than hold up the roof. When there were meetings, people sat with their back to certain posts, depending on their status in society. So there were posts for chiefs, according to their status, and posts for speakers, and so on. And ordinary people sat around the side on mats. The last area I want to look at today is the attachment of the beams and posts, what you call fixing the construction. Traditionally, no nails or screws were used anywhere in such a building. Instead, coconut fibres were braided into rope to fix the beams and posts together. The old people of the village usually made and plaited the rope. This was a lengthy process. An ordinary house used about 40,000 feet of this rope. And as you can see in this picture, the rope was pulled very tightly and wound round the beams and posts in a complex pattern. And in fact, the process of tying it to the beams so that it was tight and strong enough to keep them together is one of the great architectural achievements of Polynesia. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.